the bench to the bleachers. You are listening to the only podcast in Ontario that keeps you in the game. Five, four, three, two, one. This episode of In The Game is coming to you from Western Survivor Beef Jerky. That's right, Western Survivor Beef Jerky. Get your jerky on at www.westernsurvivor.ca. My next guest on In The Game is from Dallas, Texas. He is a former minor league baseball player and is an artist. He is also the founder of a sweet company called Warstick. This episode features Ben Jenkins, founder of Warstick. Ben, you are in the game. Welcome to the show, my man. How did you get, before we talk about Warstick, as a child growing up, you must have had oh, okay. influences. Yeah, right? sure. Yeah, the basic story is um, I grew up in Texas. Uh, Pretty much you could summarize my youth in uh, uh, two buckets, which was team sports, team sports, team sports. You know, I played baseball, football. I was, those are my two main things. Uh, tech, football here in Texas is, is a huge thing and probably still to this day the most fun I've ever had in sports. But I was uh, not the biggest guy. So uh, uh Baseball was always a little bit more of where I thought I was going. The other side of things was at home, at school, kind of honestly behind the scenes, I was always doing art. Um, you know, nurture, it was kind of like sports with dad, art with mom, you know. Uh, and so I always kind of saw myself as those two things and I compartmentalized it. I would have like my sports friends and my art friends. I was in bands and all that kind of stuff. So just grew up doing that. That was kind of my normal routine, you know, and, and every day I would do a little bit of both. Um, you know, in high school and college, sports really uh, uh, became the focus and um, was really, got really serious about baseball and football. Um, I got a scholarship to play uh, college baseball um, and uh decided to do that. And luckily, um, I went to Mississippi State University, which for baseball was just like a dream come true type of thing. And some of the best college baseball fans in America and just in the SEC and was just really a big challenge. Uh, But luckily, it turns out, and you would never think that uh, Mississippi State had a great art program. And um, those guys thought I was weird because I was a baseball player, you know. So I just had, you know, there was people there and professors that really said, hey, look, I was honestly went to grow uh, paint and draw. And uh, I I was more of a fine arts person at that point. I had a painting professor who's still a friend of mine today and a mentor and just said, hey, look, I know you love to paint and draw, but the way that your mind operates and your brain operates, you really care more about composition and placement and how things are. And you're hyper obsessive about that. He's basically saying, you're a little crazy, so I think you should try, you know, graphic design. I honestly didn't even know that was at the time. Um, So he kind of dragged me in to do another professor's design class. And the instant I found that Command-Z button, to be honest, which I don't know if you know, it just, (laughs) the ability to try something and then go back in time six steps for my kind of crazy was amazing compared to like, you're working on a painting, that's a little bit hard to do. So I instantly took to design and decided that's what I want to do. And then college was much the same. You know, I'm over here going to baseball practice and then I'm going to learn design in the mornings, you know. Um, So so Ben, so did you find yourself as a baseball player, you know, like people who are in sports and get to that level, like if you're playing D1 or higher or minor ball or, or, or the pros, you're at a high level. Did you find the music and the arts and the artistic side to be a little bit of a a release from the mental drain of sports? Could you say that? Uh, 
I probably never figured it out, but in hindsight, absolutely. When I was struggling in baseball, it was because I was grinding too hard in baseball and worrying about it too much. I remember specific time spans of when I was playing much better, especially by the time I was a senior, where I really was serious about my art and what I was doing. And I would not worry so much about baseball and I would go play baseball in more of a fun manner and boom, I would play better. Right. I just you had, wasn't you had, worried about it. You had the best, yeah. of, you had the best of both worlds happening. For yeah. You. Yeah, for sure. Um, no, for sure. Um, and vice versa. I mean, I was, you know, baseball was almost a release of just, I, I played better baseball when I would go out and just, just uh, be an athlete and not worry, which a lot of, we'll get into war stick, but, a lot of it, a lot of war stick is based on my shortcomings as a baseball player and a perfectionist and learning how important the mental game is. But, you know, after I, I, I played college, I had a great senior year. I got uh, picked up by the Philadelphia Phillies, um, which uh, another, not something I grew up expecting to be able to do. And it just was, a, you know, it was a fun thing to get to uh, try out for a while. Um, but like so many other people, um, I just didn't have the full package of things that it takes to be a major league player. I had the athletic ability, but I honestly didn't have the mental. I just, I didn't really believe that I was that good. And that was mostly it. Um, but I, uh, you know, in the injuries like everybody else, uh, and, uh, I decided to go to grad school. Uh, I got released and instead of like fighting to get back into pro baseball, I just, I just, I, I felt really lucky that I had something else that I cared about, right? So I dropped it. I just dropped it. Not that I wasn't upset. I mean, I really missed baseball for a couple of years, but I went to grad school in Chicago um, to really get serious about what I was doing. And in the process of doing that, I was studying everything. I was studying philosophy, design, film. I was just exploring still what I really wanted to do. And then, Doing that, I had a professor take me to uh, South Dakota uh, to the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation where he was doing some social work and doing some documentaries about uh, gang life on the reservation. And that really changed my life just because it changed my worldview and perspective about what, where I'd come from and what was really going on out there. And it just set me off kind of into a path of really – saying I wanted my art and stuff to more than anything, just pick people up, inspire people. And I didn't know what that meant or where I was or anything like that. So um, the Native American connection started there. From that point, I really stayed connected to that and developed friends and tried to find ways to support more than anything. Uh, but, uh, you know, then I spent 15 years running a um, design firm that I own still called One Fast Buffalo, which was really, you know, what it sounds like. It was graphic, just getting paid and make a living doing graphic design, building websites. But that, that evolved into becoming a brand firm. And that's really where I cut my teeth on understanding what, what branding is, what marketing is about. And flash forward 15 years, I was a little burned out of just working with clients because I'm a very, there's, there's a great reward with working with clients, but there's also just this thing where it's never a hundred percent what you want to build, right? Like if you're my client, my job is to, to build you something that works, but it does come along with your input. And so maybe it was 90% of what I really want to do. Maybe it was 80%, maybe it was 99%. And I kept thinking, I would love to build one thing that's just a hundred percent what I want to do. So all War Stick started off as was a, a side project that I said, Hey, you know what? I'm going to be the client on this. And I didn't expect anything to work. <laughs> I took about three months and I took Fridays off and I started working on it. And I launched it three months later as an online uh, wood bat company where you would order a bat, we would make it and, sh and ship it. I was shocked that someone bought one and uh, that was it. And then so I did that for two or three years, just totally as a hobby, which was the point, just some extra side income, running it virtually, all that kind of stuff. And then um, about four years into it, I realized, you know, this is real. This could really work. I should take this more seriously. Um, I got two investors 
which allowed me really time to really go to, to, to put client work a little bit more to the side to spend more time on war stick. And that was four years ago. And that's where, that's where we are today, which has been, I've never worked so hard in my life, but, uh, well, it, it looks a like really a real ride. It looks like it's paying off. I mean, I, I look at your company. Oh, yeah. I look at your company again, and I look at my hockey agency. It's uh, called, called Gladiator Hockey Agency, and it's funny how I came across your brand. And you have some slogans in there: gratitude, but battle. One of the slogans we use, and why we use the term gladiator with our agency with our younger prospects, was battle ready that was one of our slogans like wanted them mm-hmm. to be like warriors on the ice right and it's yeah that's how when i saw your brand i'm like this this guy gets it i mean yeah. I'm, I'm looking at it and it's all about hard work it's all about dedication even the person who starts that company then they rely on their clients to build it as warriors like the way i look at it, like i mean you've got some guys you started making baseball bats they're pretty filthy I mean, I have to say, I've seen I've seen some bat companies that were Canadian made up here. I'm sure you're aware who they were because we're from Canada, mm-hmm. and I just, you know, bats are bland sometimes. Sure. And, and when you looked at your product, I was like, they were simple yet they were elegant, but yet they were modern, but yet they were powerful. Like it was sleek, right? And I went, yeah, <laughs> it's it's so, it's amazing. So part of that, yeah, part of that was really easy. Part of that was hard. The part that was really easy is as a graphic designer, I looked at baseball. I I thought baseball would be a good place to do some kind of entrepreneurial venture because I do believe that you, I know the world. I know the lingo. I know how the people think. It wasn't foreign to me. But what was easy was the design part because the bar was just pretty low. It was just very uncreative. Uh, it was very much like, uh, you know, this company copies what this company does copies with this company. And so it was easy for me as a branding and des- person and the designer to go, well, here's all the things I'm not going to do. And here's what, and so it really just was that, that was simpler. What was, and so it was easy to make the products, uh, you know, look cool, look pretty, not, uh, I, I'm old enough a designer to know that it's about, uh, bold simplicity, right? It's not about how much crap you can throw on the bat. There's, which is more what's out there. Sim- so, sim- um, symmetrical lines, like balance, colors, yeah, right? Yeah, just, yeah. yeah. So right. I can, when in design, doing things that are striking is literally about digging down and taking away till you don't have anything left to take away. And, and that's kind of when I was done. And the aesthetic of war stick came to me pretty quickly. Um, and it's, it has evolved, but, the part that was much harder was, um, and performance, and let's say performance side was not that hard. Making wood bats isn't all that complicated. It's not rocket science, and the reality is it's not like this uh, technology race. Uh, once we got into metal bats and stuff, yeah, that was, that was more difficult. But, so that was easy. What was hard was, I still said, but what is it I'm putting into this stuff besides just design that gives it the why like the heart and soul and i really wanted it to be like that and so i decided to make it really personal and honestly i i should go back and figure out like i can't super remember the process of even coming up with the name war stick but it was in simple terms it just you know what i loved about sports was the war of it i loved the the i was super competitive i would go out there uh and if my mind was right uh you would not feel like this guy that you're playing against didn't care. I would, I would fight, you know, that, that was my personality to go out and really attack. Um, you know, and so I wanted to, at least one level really bring, I wanted you to have this bat in your hand and really have it somehow inspire a little bit extra energy than you normally bring or a normal product would bring. And I thought, you know, if I could actually have the product bring a little extra mental edge or a little mental energy to really inspire you to attack, that would be the heart and soul of what this company is about. And that evolved into something deeper, which was um, understanding what I was bad about, which was if I had a bad game, if I had a bad at bat, I didn't really deal with adversity that well. I trusted my athletic ability more than I, I didn't, 
I didn't, I didn't have my mental game together. And so Warstick really started to evolve and to go, that would be the real gift that we could give, especially the youth players would be the ability to start believing in themselves more and the ability to deal with failure and have something bad happen. And in the next couple minutes, take the next steps towards getting over that. If I could have done that, I wouldn't be talking to you right now because I might have played professional baseball for a good long time. But the reality is, and now meeting professional baseball players like my business partner, I see the difference. I'm a perfectionist. That's a horrible thing to be as a baseball player. It's maybe the worst approach you could do. Maybe in hockey, it would be a little, I probably would have been a much better uh, hockey player. But as a, bu- uh, but as a businessman, you know. being competitive from sports and as a business person like myself, the perfectionist, like even my wife will say, even my uh, oh, yeah. my employees that work for me, it's I'm constantly changing things with my business, and they're like, yeah. "Why, why?" And I'm like, "Cause it's not good enough. I don't like it. I'm sure. not so, you know." And that's oh, it's a right. That's I don't a, soak about it. It is my journey. I mean, in in design, being perfectionist is a perfect thing to be. I can sit and work with something until it's done, and I decide when it's done, and I decide when it's perfect or close enough and perfect. And then you're right. Business is waking up every day solving issues, trying to refine things, make things better, make things work better. And you kind of have to be a perfectionist in a way to have the, you know, if you're not, if you don't have that little bit of crazy mentality, you're, you're not going to, you're not going to make it. You got to be a little bit crazy. So I'm not sulking about not becoming an, an athlete. I'm just saying it gave me something, all my struggles in baseball, uh, like college baseball was not easy for me. I mean, I, (laughs) It was like, uh, you know, I kept getting a little, you know, it, it took me a while to really get my feet under me and stuff, but that struggle was what this whole thing's built on. So it wasn't that I'm built worse because I was such a good baseball player. It was actually because I knew what was bad to turn that into a positive thing. And that's really where we are really able to maintain like a, a, a soul and a culture to this thing because there's a conversation we can have beyond. I mean, it's really boring to talk about bats all the time. It's just boring. So we don't, we don't do it. I mean, we, uh, we make sure people understand that the performance is there, that they meet the standards, all that kind of stuff. But we, I mean, our tagline is literally, it's not the weapon, it's the warrior. It's like a company telling you literally, this bat isn't going to make you better. You're going to make yourself better. And I think that really, I don't know that my competitors understand that or know what to do with that, but that's okay. I mean, I, but our, some, our fans some, get it, get it. And, and some, not everybody gets war stick and it's not for it. And I don't think brands should be at this point. They should be very specific and about what they're about. And then you're going to have a group of people that, that follow that. But your product, uh, let's like stick to the baseball bats. When your pro ball players have that in their hand, athletes always go with the, you know, look good, feel good, play good. Right. So mm-hmm. meaning when that product's in their hand and they're like, man, they, you know, Bo Jackson used to break bats over their knees, right? It's like mm-hmm. you saw that basic looking bat that got smashed over his knee, but it was almost like if he took one of those, you know, s- slick looking black with gold bats that you had and snapped it over your knees, some people would be like, oh my God, it's like art that he just broke, you know, and that's what I'm saying. Some of those players feel in tune with the bat themselves that it, oh, for it sure. it's makes an extension. Them- Yes, yes, an extension of them, uh, like you said, as a warrior, right? I, I, I want to really, like I said, being Canadian, I haven't heard the product up here, and, and I'm hoping one day it is up here because baseball is growing fast, as is basketball because of the Toronto Raptors. Um, I want to, you know, when I, when I watched your social media and I came across and I saw jackets, like even soft goods when you were doing the hard goods, and I'm like, hey, that's a – that's a really sick looking jacket, right? And then right. I look, I look, and I go, "How the hell did he get Jack? What? What's Jack White doing <laughs> wearing a freaking jacket, right?" So again, this yeah. is when I first learned of your company, and I'm kind of researching. Sure. I'm like, Ian Kinsler, Jack, what? What the hell is going on here, right? So, yeah, all, all of a sudden, for anybody that doesn't know Warstick, um, you know, with you founding the the company, you're kind of linked in with. Uh, MLB all-star Ian Kinsler and uh, Jack White, the musician, mm. they're almost perfect fits. Would you not think? Like, I mean, it, it's, it's unique. You're one of the few people, yeah, you're one of the few people who's ever said that, and I believe that. But, of course, when I first did it, of course, it was easy for people to say Ian was a perfect fit because Ian 
literally is a warrior. Like, as far as like, if you could build a baseball player that was a war stick player and put him on the field, Ian Kinzer would be it because he's tough. I mean, he last year, a couple of years ago, he went viral because he cut the a ball, cut the end of his finger off. He really reached down and put some dirt on it, like didn't think about it. And it went viral. And it's just like, that's so Ian. And then on top of it, like I've never met a guy that's he's not cocky, but he's the most confident he's, player he's I've com- ever met. He's confident, like, yes. Confident. He's able to deal with any failure in a way that I just, if I could bottle it up and sell it, I, I just kind of, I like being around him and trying to understand it. And so we couldn't have a business partner that wasn't that. And he, he came to, I just happened and we just got really lucky. And then people didn't understand, on the other hand, why would you make a famous uh, iconic rock star into a, a, a business partner, owner of a baseball bat company. And yeah, he does love baseball. Like he, he, he loves baseball. He loves the history of baseball, but that really, that was why he was interested in us, but that wasn't really why I was interested in him. I was interested in him because war stick is this combination of high performance, uh, durable sporting goods, which Ian goes out and proves, right? He uses it at the highest level. He proves that our stuff works. But Warstick is also about our our own style of creativity and our own path and doing it like we want. And that is what Jack is. Jack does exactly what he wants. He he's a he's a true artist and he builds what he wants to build and hopes that there's an audience for it. He doesn't pander to the audience and build what they want to build. And I just love that independence and creative freedom. And I'm like, these two partners would represent those two sides to me and give me that balance of, we always have to make sure things are done uh, and built well on this side, but we always have to remember that we're doing this in our own way. And so basically I wake up every day and I try to perform for them. That's what I do. Yeah. I'm trying to make them, I'm trying to make them proud and they basically turn around and they are super supportive, but they're also, I mean, they just care and they contribute. And it's, it's I, I think I have the best business partners in the world. And it just, I just was lucky uh, that that happened. Um, simple as that. Well, I can, I can see both of them making things fun for you because I saw, yeah. I saw, I saw some of the stuff with the Sandlot stuff and, and, and yeah, with like the retro goal. I was mm-hmm. like, again, I'm, I mean, as an yeah, the, the, app. oh it's amazing right i look at it and i go the hats the uniforms the bats i'm like this is fun this is creative this is his, historical like meaning yeah. you're, you're going retro right and- well we do well we try to do both we try to have the balance we you know i don't see right re- worst as a retro company we 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 try to stay very modern and moving yes. forward but at the same time i love vintage things i love old things and the 20, we can have a percent of war stick stuff that's kind of on that fun side. And I actually, that's kind of where where Jack would, uh, you know, me and Jack jive on and stuff. And Jack's gotten really into the Sandlot games and all that kind of stuff. But um, the, uh, I have to build products that appeal to what's going on right now and players right now. But I, there's a lot of things that I know from vintage stuff that, you know, bold simplicity really is what vintage means in my mind. If you look at old stuff and how the way it was done, um, there's just a bold simplicity to it. And I think that we have a nice balance. So it's just nice. Ian actually is the one that lets us do the more fun, you know, funky (laughs) stuff because Ian's out there in the major leagues proving that it works. I mean, Josh, I mean, talk about Canada, you know, you mentioned Canada, I remember the first day I met Ian, I had a three hour lunch with him and we just instantly jived. And he literally called me an hour later and said, I just talked to Josh Donaldson about this. And he was excited to go tell Josh. And then the first year we were in the major leagues. No, that was, a, yeah, the first year Josh Donaldson had just won the MVP. Yeah. You had the bringer, then, you had the bringer of rain and then you ended up with Kevin Pillar, correct? Yeah. And uh, Josh switched his bat to Warstick, the first at bat of his post like who switches their bat? You don't win an MVP and switch your bat. You stick with it. And that's right. He switched his bat. It was incredible. I mean, I have one of my favorite all time war stick pictures is a picture of Josh Donaldson hitting a grand slam in Toronto 
with our bat. And it's just the most amazing pitcher. It was a huge moment for us. And, um, you know, the reason we're not so much in Canada is not because we don't want to be. It's just that up until really about 30 days ago, we've been a direct-to-consumer based brand where you get on our website, we ship you this stuff. Well, it's just really expensive to ship things to Canada for people. So um, we're working on some things that might change that and open it up more in a retail environment in Canada and stuff like that, um, as well as, you know, Japan, Korea, things like that. So we're we're kind of at the point now where we're starting to selectively uh, uh, form retail partnerships with people that we think can really drive our business. Um, and that includes getting outside of the U S so, and then like you with the hockey, I mean, the plan really with war stick is, uh, I think if I would have been a crappy minor league hockey player, instead of a crappy minor <laughs> baseball player, war stick probably would have been a hockey stick from the beginning, or I could have been a lacrosse player and it would have been that. So really what I'm building over a long period of time and very slowly as a, is what I call instead of a stick brand, a, a baseball stick brand for warriors, it would be a stick brand for warriors meaning behind the scenes we're working on hockey sticks, lacrosse sticks. I'm looking at, I'm in my studio. Uh, I've got snowboards, skateboards, surfboards, hunting arrows. Um, walk. I mean, if it's a stick for a sport, we want to make it over time. And, and because all of the mentality of it still applies. It, it, and I really don't want to do the thing where, you know, you might see a big sporting goods company go, I can't say my competitors' names, but ABC Sports Baseball, ABC Sports Hockey. You know they divide the players by their sport. I don't want to do that. I want you to go to War Stick Instagram and see a hockey player next to a lacrosse player, next to a baseball player, next to a hunter, next to a surfer, and bring all those guys more together. Um, it's just I I use this stick, you use that stick, but we all have the same mentality. I think that would be more interesting and fun for us to do. That divide it up so much uh oh fast i didn't mention softball fast pitch and softball would be the, probably the the thing that we're the closest on launching yeah so. soft, softball fastball is really huge up in canada i actually played a few oh, yeah. years, i played a few years of fastball for men's and then hardball for or baseball for men's but my wife also uh still at 44 is playing competitive fast pitch so uh yeah. it, it's huge up here now my question for you how many guys now in such a – and I will say it's a, a short span over the last couple of years. How many guys now in the major leagues are using Warstick uh, bats or products? Oh uh, Yeah, I get that question a lot, and I understand the perspective of that is that it's a growth thing that we would want as many guys as we can or that we, that we can have interested. But the reality is actually the very opposite. When we got into the major league with Ian, we decided from the get-go that we would keep it small – so that we could keep the quality really high, but mostly because, I mean, we're very honest about the fact that we do major league baseball for the marketing of it to prove not for the marketing of it, not so much for the exposure, but for the ability to have it approve how good our stuff is. And the reality is we knew from, a, from an early standpoint that marketing is really like, I can't show Josh Donaldson or, Ian Kinsler or Miguel Cabrera or Kevin Pillar in their uniforms using our bats. It's illegal for yep. us. Yep. I can't do it. So what's the point of me having, it's kind of two things. You either need to have like three players so that people catch all, you know, all you're hoping is that on TV, people catch glimpses of the logo on TV, which is pretty hard to do. And most your common people just don't even ever think to look or, where we went was let's have a small group of selected players who want to be part of something special, but we can have a personal relationship with them. So we have, we try to keep it at about a dozen and we try to make sure that that guy represents what we're doing just by naturally being himself. So Kevin Pillar, the newest, best. Oh, the guy is, the guy, the fan. guy, the guy is a war stick. He's a person. warrior, man. The guy is amazing. They yeah. call, they and call, he didn't, you know, and, it, and he, it took, a, it's funny cause it, kind of took a while for him to kind of start coming around and stuff <laughs> like that. But uh, getting to know him and obviously I love the way he played. I honestly, uh, Oh, he's a warrior. He always he's, a, more he's, a, a he's a gamer. He's a gamer. He's such a gamer, man. He is the Ian Kinsler. If he was a center fielder, that's Kevin Pillar. So our philosophy is more, it's really about how 
good of a fit the guy is and how much they can get into the culture. And then we're able to do things like make a film with this guy, make a, make a video with this guy and express what Warstick is about through his approach to his mentality of being a warrior. And so, you know, it is, uh, I mean, probably over the years, probably 50, 60 guys have used Warstick because we're kind of tinkering and seeing if this guy sticks and all that kind of stuff. But it's like, it's just kind of a small, close group of soldiers, man. It's, it's what it is. I just think of it as like a, a platoon of guys and I got all different shapes and sizes, you know, like I've got my lead off hitters. I've got my big power hitters, all that kind of stuff. So it's not, and I actually have guys that aren't very known in the league, but are, you know, Alex Avila, Brian Holiday, not household names, but they're incredibly great guys who are, I mean, they're still big league players, but it's just like, we like that you might see Bryce Harper swing it one day. And then, uh, and, and I don't mean to be, demean these players, but obviously not everybody has the stature of Bryce Harper, right? Yeah. But yeah. there's more to it than that. You know, it's about, we make sure that there are really good guys. Like they're guys that um, care about other people and how they treat people. And that's going to reflect on how kids see them and, and that kind of thing. So it's, a, it's just a cool, and it's just interesting to see, you know, what players might come along that really click with what we're doing, you know, and, and we don't pay them. We can't, we don't pay them. We don't, it's completely organic, a reciprocal relationship. We treat them like gold. Don't get me wrong. Um, you know, and they might, there's little things. We'll make a really cool jacket, player's jacket that you saw. Yeah. Uh, Alex Avila is getting that. <laughs> Well, but, you're creating a team, man. Like, like I said, yeah. go back to when you were talking about, you know, we only have these many guys. I, I look at it as you're wanting players that represent your beliefs and your product, meaning without being told what it is. They take it, they look at it, they understand it, and you're like, this is the type of player that represents the brand. It's all about the brand. And whether it's an offensive player, whether it's a defensive player, whether it's a, a grinder, um, it's all about the brand. Like you said, warrior, you're going out looking at a player that's coming around talking to you and you're like, you know what? I've always admired that ball player or that guy off the field as a personality. Uh, he, yeah. he represents us well. Like you said, Josh Donaldson, it's funny because, or uh, not Josh Donaldson, Kevin Pillar. Like that, that was my wife's favorite player in Toronto. I mean, yeah. the, the amount of catch, not the, the catches that guy made were, we're insane. He never yeah. gave up on a ball, no matter how far it was out of his reach or if he couldn't track it. Yeah. And that, that's your essence of a guy that's a, a grinder, a gamer, a warrior, right? And that's what... He's not concerned about his health. He's concerned about catching the ball and beating you. Yeah, yeah. Period. He's not a prima donna. He's not going to He's not gonna run back to the wall thinking, man, if I slam into the wall, I might end my career. It's like he has one goal is to catch the ball and win. And that's... You know, the, all of our guys have that mentality in common. I mean, that's kind of the one, you know, despite, you know, Miguel Cabrera is a much different player than Kevin Pillar. And, and there's a joy, and part of it too is just a joy, you know, a gratitude for what they're getting to do. Like Miguel Cabrera, like almost no one I've ever seen. If you ever go just go, go pregame and watch BP, Miguel Cabrera has fun before the game, during the game. He, he just – there's a joy and passion for it that, that he has. But he's he's going to – I just love – Miggy, there's something about Miggy that's just like he could go out there and just try to hit home runs and, try, and, and, and probably lead the league in home runs. But, you know, he's also – if there's a guy in third base and that's going to make the difference in the game, he will shoot a ball through the, through the right side of the infield. No big deal. Single and win the game. I mean, he's just that – I love that well-rounded mentality towards – being a complete hitter, which is also just part of the culture of war sake of trying to get kids away from the current trend of like, it's all strikeouts and home runs. And I'm like, it's boring. Not to mention you're not on your team win in every instance. And, and so we're also trying to, in, a, in some small way, help change the game back to something that's more interesting to watch, you know, but anyway, I don't know where I'm going with that. Well, you brought up the word, culture or i guess even uh, i might have heard the word heritage in there um you're a hunter or you're a fisherman probably first and foremost um yeah. how much does that type of thing influence your creativity and some of your products moving forward meaning i've seen your social media 
it looks like you were in Colorado on the rivers. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. man, you're not hearing anything in, from miles around. You're in beautiful, serene country. Your mind is free, right? When yeah. you're in that, when you're in that zone. Yeah, it's, I mean, I needed something when I, you know, I didn't actually, uh, I loved when I was growing up, I did some surfing and some snowboarding and skiing and I loved outdoors, but I didn't really discover, uh, you know, hunting and fishing until after my playing career. And I really needed to find something that gave me that competitive feeling, but I really didn't care to deal with what fans thought of what I was doing or teammates or all that and win this and win that there's like surfing. And I spend any, as much time as I can surfing and fly fishing because they are extremely hard <laughs> and they are a, something that you can do to your really old and just keep the, the competitive thing there is to work on getting for myself, just, learning as much as I can all the time and getting better and better. And I'm kind of really up here with fly fishing and I'm always struggling with surfing to even keep up. Like it's just, uh, it's, it, it's something that I enjoy the struggle of, but it's like, I love the solitude of it. Like, like you said, like I'm out there, it's now my release, you know, business is a grind and I kind of see it as I'm working so that I can go fly fishing. I'm working so that I can go surfing. And I really enjoy it when I'm doing it because I'm totally letting myself have permission to go enjoy it and not worry about business when I do it. But, um, you know, the crossover between war stick and those things is simple. It's yeah, it's the culture of a warrior, but there's this really great crossover between a warrior and a hunter and the mindset of, uh, tact tactfully strategically going out, and hunting something, there's a calmness to it that you have to have. You can't just, it's not about like, it's not like Braveheart, right? It's not like, like that's not what we're talking about. I'm more of like the stalking, hunting, hitting. Hitting a baseball is a process of um, staying calm, being ready, being in the moment and attacking. And you can't, ta you can't hit, I mean, it's just so I can see a kid hit and he's kind of more like this. He's defensive. His posture is an attack mode when he's confident. And so the hunting metaphor, it's just been really powerful with kids understanding that you got to get up there and you got to be ready and you got to be attacking and you got to be aggressive, but you got to stay calm. So hunting is just this cool thing. So we made a little film called clear shot that talks about, uh, we worked with the Navy seal and uh, we were shooting high powered rifles and it's just, we did this stress test where you run around and get really tired and you start to lose your senses a little bit. And the whole challenge of it was to try to calm down enough and control your breathing enough so that you actually could physically perform what you're trying to do. And so the hunting's just been a good time to hunt is, I mean, it's not the weapon, it's the warriors, the official thing, but time to hunt is kind of more the, the mentality of the actual action of hitting and stuff. And so um, there's a lot of crossover uh, in baseball players and hunting, you know, um, well, you, so. even, even your, you, you made a comment about, uh, teaching yourself with fly fishing and, and, you know, the, having to work hard at it and having to, you know, you get better at it and better at it. I almost go back to the design of the bats where you have, like you said, failure in the fishing, when you're learning, you are creating the bats, you're designing the bats, you have your failures because every business has a failure to succeed it's almost the same where at the end when you continue to work hard or you, you, you don't give up, you know, you have that finished beautiful product in your hand, but it's just like the fly fishing where when you don't give up and you, and you, and you keep going with it, you have that beautiful brookie or brown or bow. Absolutely. In your hand. I actually, I think it's a really insightful point. Um, and I, I've, I've been living in Colorado for the last six weeks. I got, um, uh, back to Texas, uh, recently cause my kids are starting up baseball finally. But, um, I actually don't like, I don't like to go out fishing and on the first, second cast, catch a fish. Uh, one, I just think it's bad luck. And then the rest of the days you're bad and I'm superstitious. But the other thing is the most gratifying days I have on the river are when I have to really work for it. I got to like, I may go an hour, two hours, three hours without catching a single fish, but 
it's the figuring out I'm a move. Like when I'm on the river, I'm constantly moving. I'm not sitting there in one spot. I'm, I'm moving, I'm stalking, I'm trying things. It's about figuring out where they're, where they are and what they're doing. And I see it as an attack type thing. And so the best days I've had on the river might be, I worked for three hours. I walked nine miles, but I caught a 20 inch brown. I'd rather do that and catch 50 fish. You know what I mean? It's kind of the, 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 you know, the beauty of, of that, that moment and the, and, and the battles that happen, but it's a working towards getting that, that make me appreciate that fish. Um, I mean, that's what I, that's why I like about fishing. Um, and I, you know, with the fly rods, so it's kind of like when the fly rods come out, hopefully here in a couple months, um, uh, I don't know. I kind of already know the story of how we'll market those and what it's about, you know, it's not like an old traditional fly fisherman sitting there with a basket and, just hitting this hole for hours, it's kind of an attack thing. And so I kind of, that's the mentality of it to me. So you think you'll ever get into flies as well, as well as the rods? I mean, you're making baseballs, uh, right? You're, you're making. Yeah, but I'm already, I'm already breaking some of my rules. Uh, you know, I just based on my client experience, I just, I'm really a big believer that you can't be all things to everything to all people. And that, you know, even most of my competitors make, they're in baseball, they make bats, so they make gloves, they make catching gear, they make all this kind of stuff. I'm trying as best I can to stick with the war stick is about offense, not defense. Yep. But, you know, we're, I'm, I'm doing some things on that side, like a handmade baseball. I am doing some fielding gloves, but I think of it more as, I'm not trying to compete in the the glove business, the glove industry with my gloves. I'm just trying to provide that core war stick fan who's so fanatical and cuts my logo in his hair. <laughs> he might want a glove. You know what I mean? It's like, it, it's just really making it for the audience that's there. So I'm doing, I'm starting to break those rules a little bit. I'm trying to be careful about it, but um, so you, yeah, you, flies. I can't say I wouldn't make flies, but like it's, it's the formulas make the rod. <laughs> yeah, make the. <laughs> you know what I mean. So the more I've always looked into you, or have looked into you, you impress me more and more and more. I kind of envy you uh, from where you came from, um, and I have a, a lot of respect for you. You know, Thank you. I've, I've seen things with uh, Mr. Slater in the in the surfing world. I've seen mm -hmm. uh, Doc uh, Paskowitz. Uh, oh wow, you know which, Doc Paskowitz. Well, well, actually, Adam we'll be coming on the podcast in, in, in no a month. way. Yeah. yeah so Adam taught me to surf. So, so in the fact I was about to give up for sure. And then one day Adam, <laughs> Adam was like, he, he was out in the water and he's like, this is a 10, this is a 10, this is a 10, but this one thing you're doing wrong. And it all of a sudden clicked. And otherwise I think I would have quit surfing, but I owe my surfing, uh, keeping in it to Adam. He's a great guy. So that's yeah. really cool. Yeah. I mean, it, my struggle with him is it's been three weeks between messages because they're they're oh, they're trekking around the world. Time, man. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, but anyways, and another one is I really, really, really saw. I couldn't believe it when I saw it. And you know what? I I was always a serious guy. I always put away my money. I always I'm living life now, and I'm 41. Yeah, I think I waited too long for this. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I saw Pearl Jam in 09 and saw him in 2011 and I saw freaking Eddie mm -hmm. Vedder with a battle shirt and you designed a surfboard for Eddie freaking Vedder. Like, <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah. Look at that. Eh? I, 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 I have so no, much, it's, uh, I have so much okay. I have res respect for you because Eddie Vedder is a unique person. Anybody that knows Eddie, he's a caring, loving man. He's a unique individual. Yeah. He doesn't, uh, you know, dive into things. Uh, that don't represent his beliefs and usually they're good beliefs. And when yeah. I saw him wearing your shirt from uh war stick and you designed a surfboard for him, I was blown away. I was floored more so than Jack white being well, a part of the company. Yeah. But I have to give all credit of course to any, anything that you've seen me get to do, like make a surfboard for Eddie Vedder and have a three hour dinner or, and we made bats for him too. Uh, you know, Beyonce bought a bat. Uh, Paul Simon bought a bat. Uh, I, obviously, none of that would be happening without the connection to Jack. And the, the, the reality is those people admire Jack so much. I mean, they, when I, I mean, Eddie, 
adores Jack. Uh, Neil Young adores Jack. I, it's that stuff's Jack White. The only credit I get is that they think what he's doing with Door Stick is really cool, and they do like what we've made, and they think it's really cool. That's all I'm doing. They appreciate. But they Jack, appreciate. They, Jack, man. they appreciate the art. I'm. I'm no, sure. And, they, and, and Eddie. Eddie. I mean, yeah. Obviously, I'm, I'm of the Pearl Jam age. And have always been a huge fan and just, you know, getting to meet him and, and, and just have normal human discussions and realizing he's maybe one of the happiest guys I've ever met. And you think, well, why wouldn't he be, well, <laughs> you know, yeah. and then, yeah. and, uh, it's just been super cool. And I just try not to ruin that kind of thing. Um, but that's all Jack, man. Can I, can I, can I ask you something? So being Eddie better, I mean, we're both on the same page there. You know, we both like the uh, wilderness type deal. Um, Into the wild. You had to like that movie with the soundtrack. Well, Eddie better, Right. Well, honestly, uh, yeah. Funny story. Um, I saw that movie when it came out and at the time I had probably was a good 40 pounds overweight just by being a graphic designer is not the most athletic movement type thing. I just gotten, I was unhappy. I was, I was not uninspired by my work. I was overweight. I had not, I had basically done all I could to take the athleticism out of myself. There was something about that movie that clicked with me and literally woke me up to this isn't the life that I want to be living. I wasn't going to go be Chris McCandless and, it, there, was, there, there was just, there was something about it that changed my mindset and I lost that year 45 pounds <laughs> and it, I, which is weird. I didn't, I can't believe that I had 45 pounds to lose because I was yeah. the next professional athlete and it was just like, you got to appreciate and have gratitude for your well being more than that, more than anything, which led to doing that led to me going okay in my work what do i really care about what do i don't that led to starting something like four stick so i literally at the dinner with eddie vetter said and i really this is really i, I can't imagine that war stick would have ever existed had not seen that movie so i actually got to tell him that and he had a really funny reaction to it like a really cool funny reaction he came over and hugged me but he was kind of making fun of me but um yeah, that was that was cool. So that movie and just the story of that, um, you know, that's what you do, man. You make art so that it has an effect on people and you may never know what how you affect people. And I know that Jack and Eddie experience that all the time because they're constantly making art that affects people and all that. And they're so normalized to that. But like, um, yeah, that's interesting that you brought that up. Well, it's, it's funny because we... Now that I'm talking to you, there was a, a, a six degrees of separation sort of to speak. A friend of mine, I went to school in Connecticut um, in the mid-90s, and I hadn't seen my friend for 20-something years. He lives in Detroit. Uh, his wife actually was uh, worked for Obama and Joe Biden at the time in the White House. And it's mm -hmm. funny because in their press uh, briefings, I, I saw a picture with the seat in front of them, it said Eddie Vedder. So Eddie was supposed to be there. But they also live, I guess, because they showed me when I went there last summer, they live four houses down from Jack's house in Indian Village in Detroit. I guess he had oh, recently, yeah. recently purchased the house and had a, a yeah. painted block on the outside. And I think Meg mm -hmm. lived kitty corner on diagonal from them. So, so it's kind yeah. of funny, funny how someone I hadn't seen for 20 years, they're in Detroit, you know, they're in, they went to a political thing, Eddie's there, and then they live a couple doors down from Jack. And here we are talking yeah. about both of them. So it's kind of, it's kind of cool. Um, so yeah. moving, moving forward, what do you think? Like what, where are you at now? I mean, you know, I mean, props to you and, and even your business partners too for believing in you, right? Um, where are oh, you? Where yeah. are you at now? What What's going on now? I feel like, yeah, I think when I signed the deal with Jack, his team, his business team, who basically they're, you know, they try to give Jack a good advice, but they trust trust Jack's intuition about things he's doing, and they and Jack had never invested in anything. Well, not no, I had a couple things. They just believed in me because Jack believed in me. And my mindset was I've been giving this money and I know that our platform's going to uh, 
be a little bit easier to attain with these guys. But my mindset for the last four years was I go fully into this and I wake up every day and try to make them happy, which making them happy is to build war stick, to build the vision of it. And yeah, the financial uh, rewards down the road might be something, but it's not been by that, but it's to build what we're proud of. And that's been a grind. I mean, like people think the way it is now, you know, people kind of are seeing it as an overnight success or whatever. And I'm like, you should call my wife and talk to her about the overnight success part, right? right. Cause this goes back eight, nine years. But I do feel like the, we've kind of accomplished the climbing up the mountain of like, we've arrived, which is really hard to do. Um, but now the mindset is, you know, we have to tackle the mainstream market or we can't grow anymore. Basically, like we have all the customers and fans that we can get that are not what a, you know, they're just a different mentality. A mainstream market person doesn't buy things until they see other people doing it. That's different than an early adapter who is looking for that new thing. We, we crush that. Like it took a while to, to really get there, but we've now, my mindset now is how do we, into the mainstream market, but retain who we are. I was just going to say the culture of it, not kill the brand. That's tricky. Yes, that's tricky. But you know, I, my mindset, you know, I, I look, you know, uh, Patagonia is probably my favorite company. Yvonne Chouinard's business hero of mine. And he has a war stick on his desk, by the way, which I'm super proud of. And I haven't got to meet him yet, but I'm hopefully going to at some point. But like, I realized, you know, Patagonia always maintains who they are and maintains their culture and their connection with me as a consumer, even though I might find a Patagonia in a big box retail store. And I, and I just said, you know, it's time for retail. It's time to open up to this, but it's always going to be up to us to maintain our culture and personality and our direct relationship with our customers. So we'll see, man, <laughs> like it's going to be tricky to be the cool new thing but then that works and then what about when you're not the cool new thing and i think though that we have we have the content we have the conversation to have it's not just about I, our sporting goods so i feel like we're going to be okay i think gonna, we, we have to keep working on that i think you've gone past that I think you've gone past the, uh, you know, like you said, are we just a, a one thing? Like, I think it's, you're, you're here, yeah. you made a, you made an impression. Um, it's now the impression is moving forward and it's, it's mm -hmm. how, how are we growing, keeping our brand? And like you said, you know, fly fishing yeah. rods, uh, skateboards. Uh, and I think, uh, I think it's quality too, right? Um, Thank you. I can see that when I when I'm looking online, whether it's yeah. the ja the player's jacket, any of that stuff, it's it's pretty 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 cool looking. The, the last yeah. the last thing I really want to touch on um, before I let you go, because I know you're busy. Um, mm -hmm. Given all the stuff that's happened recently, uh, I guess more so. I don't want to get into politics. I, I, I kind of I can I I. I, I, <laughs> I Given I saw I saw photos. Uh, I think you guys were your store in Dallas wasn't touched too badly with what happened with uh, I would yeah. call it riots, not protests. Because I mean, you know, you protest, you can do it peacefully, but if sure. you choose to riot and loot, you're you're a criminal more or less. But I did see uh, Dirk from the Dallas Mavericks and a few others mm -hmm. helping you board your store up. That's pretty impressive and and awesome to see your community mm -hmm. uh, uh, where you are. And I also saw. You know, you, you might have took some flack online from it, but I believe wholeheartedly that you weren't just playing a race card or weren't just playing a, a political card. You, you have uh, advertisements with your young players in there, your young uh, males, and you had, I think, Native American guys, you had Caucasian, you've had African American, and you just today, you know, not meaning today, today, but during this situation, you put the African American guy at leadoff, where he might have been batting second to the Native American guy. But sure. it, it was more about we're all on the same damn team, and yeah, we all I we mean, all we all have to coexist, and and we want to show that everybody is special, everybody is a part of our team. We wanted to. It is definitely hard to navigate. We wanted to do both because our main cause is to support Native American youth and help them believe in themselves and their heritage and what they're about as warriors and to thrive and they are the most underserved in my mind community in america 
um, they don't get the attention that other movements get. They don't get the, you know, uh, we have connections. One of my business, or my investors is a very well-known uh, quad. Uh, he lost all his arms and legs in Afghanistan. He's a, he's a, uh, an army veteran. It would have been really easy for us to make our cause about supporting injured veterans. And we do uh, certain parts of the year when, it, when, when other people are focusing on it. But, but my thing was, I can't, it's very served at this point. Veterans are very much, especially over the last 20 years, like people are more aware of the, of the challenges that veterans have and, and the suicide rates and this kind of thing. And it, it just thought, yeah, that fits, but that's not where this brand comes from. So the Native American support was the heart and soul and spirit that just filled me. It wasn't like doing Native stuff or like making our stuff look Native, but it's just the energy and the fuel and the creativity of the mindset of Native America. I, I, it, it's something that affects my work. So I thought it would be better for us to support that. And that would be more daring. That would be more ballsy. We could make an effect. and it really has been incredibly well received to do that and always making sure that it's just a thing where we're doing this to feed this, you know, and it's this nice cycle and then we get fed back. But when it came to what happened, you know, the last couple of weeks with the joy thing, it was really hard. I, you know, you don't know until you know how people are going to react. And um, I just looked at my youth and it wasn't really planned, but I like, wow, we just had this photo shoot in December with our pro youth. They're all real Warstick fans, right? They're not models. They're all people that just around the country have shown that they love Warstick. And they're just, they're those kids that are like Ian Kins. And I know their names. There's Ashton, there's Toby, there's this and that. And it just happened that three were native kids. Uh, there's a Filipino kid, um, African-American kid, Ashton. Um, uh, let's see, uh, Johnny Pena, um, Hispanic, uh, white kids. I mean, we had, we had all that just because it's naturally who we are. Um, and in this, but I did at least was, and I'm not super smart, but I was smart enough to realize this is about black lives matter. This is about the specific thing. And I know all the crap about the all lives matter thing. I think that's complete crap. I think it's semantics. This is about, this moment's about this and just making sure that this is addressed right now. But it sure, I didn't want to make, you know, I had to kind of do it in this way that highlighted Ashton. I called his parents. I talked to him for an hour <laughs> and made sure that they were cool with, here's what I'm thinking. What do you think? And that's just how our, I mean, imagine a CEO of a sporting goods company having an hour long conversation with the parents of, just one of the ambassadors, you know, like I'm trying to really do this right. Um, you made, you made, lose. You made a courtesy we, call. Yeah. Yeah. But it was like, not, not courtesy. It was a courtesy, you know, call. It but was it was, a courtesy call, but it was also, I wanted their blessing. That's right. I wanted, that's, I wanted, I wanted guidance. Yes. And that, that's, 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 that's what I meant. And you were calling. So out. I think yeah. I actually accidentally did what we all need to be doing, which is shut up and listen. Right. And I think that's the thing that I did right. And I listened and I think came out was personal to me, but also respectful um, to all of our kids. And did we get flack? Absolutely. Did we lose followers? Absolutely. And I, if you go to my personal Facebook page, you can see what I really think about that. And I'm just, I'm glad to see them go. If, like that's their mindset. Then I don't want them as war. I certainly don't want them holding my back. So I told them what on my Facebook page, I told them what they could do with it. Yeah, but we won't get into that in your podcast. Well, and you know, and your your young war stick or your young warriors coming up are are looking yeah. up oh, at yeah. the product. So I you're trying think. you're trying to teach them what's you know in the end and what's right or wrong. Like I mean, to me, it's it's uh, and, and it's not all lives matter. It's just what I'm saying when I look at people is you know I, I love you, bro. Like it it really I, helps when you know <laughs> what you're about. We know we're about the warrior mentality. We know what the warrior is. And the warrior is not just this. A warrior is is really about protecting. A warrior is really about defending the defenseless. That's the real stuff. And so I'm like, that's what we got to do. I don't care what you think I yep. should be doing politically. And the reality is, <clears throat> that jump is that shark has jumped, man. Like companies get political these days. Yep. Companies take a stance. Patagonia says exactly what they think of you and what you're doing, and they will 
attack it if they don't believe in it. And I just, that's the fun of doing this. I mean, I'm going to have a perspective and we're going to say what we think. And it's not trying to be for everybody anyway. And I'm happy for someone to go buy another bat that, you know, doesn't align with that. That's totally fine. I mean, there's plenty of, uh, there's plenty of people out there that share the values that, that we are trying to uh, have. So, um, but it, you know, it's never good. Uh, it's, it's frustrating to, um, to deal with that stuff. And I don't take it too far, but um, that's what my personal Facebook page is for. <laughs> <laughs> so Ben, um, y- are you doing charities for native stuff now? Like, See, where I am, I have a uh, Six Nations, which is about uh, 25 minutes. It's Oshwegan, uh, the reserve yeah. there. And then I have another First Nation one that's about 40 minutes away. And a lot of people out there, like, and this is why I love your company, because, you know, you're bringing that to the forefront of that warrior. It's your inspiration. But a lot of people who are um, the lucky to have all the necessities don't realize, I, I don't know how it is where you are, but up here, even, you know, treatment facilities for water plant like we we've got some reserves up here where their water is contaminated and i mean sure in this day and age man it's it's, it's not acceptable and i and third world country status and that's why I'd like uh yeah that's why I like on the navajo nation was one of the most hard hit things by the covid crisis because simple things like uh there's a, a large percentage of people don't even have running water well that's going to lead to just hygiene not being where it needs to be to prevent COVID. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that, like there was, a, I mean, again, I learned this 25 years ago, just being, Hey, we're going here and we're going to see this. And I thought, this is crazy. I can't believe we're in America right now. Uh, we have so much, we have too much, you know? And it was, it was more about, there's a real need here. Um, but there's also, uh, it was the need that and not to my credit, but what people were trying to do is take a native kid and say, Hey, you're special. There's, you have so much in terms of like what you're about, what your culture is about. You're unique. You're a Pawnee kid. You're not an Osage kid. Your dip Pawnees have their own identity to this. I love the identity system within native America. There was 500 tribes or something. Well, it's actually sure. quite insane. All these different languages, all the aesthetics that go with yeah. that. It's a fascinating, but it's the diversity diversity of it that's fascinating. It's not all Native American people are. I mean, that's the stereotypical yep. thing. And so, you know, like I had to turn down things like the Braves wanted us to come out uh, this off season and do an art show, but they were calling it Chop Fest. And I was like, no, I, I think this is a cool idea, guys, but I can't come because if I do this, I'm saying that's okay and that is not okay. <laughs> And I'm telling you, we're not okay with it. I was very nice about it, but we have to do that kind of stuff. But, um, um, oh, so, I mean, just to clarify what we do, um, it took a while to figure out, like, how you support Native. It's such a big thing. What we, what we did is we created a fund called the Native American Stick Warrior Fund, which just allows us to do things like we might do a Sandlot charity game with Jack and make 50 Jack White bats and auction them off. And that money comes in or we might, there's all kinds of ways that we do it, but we're just trying to do things that raise additional funds or take from the success that we're doing, put it into this pot. But then what we do is we turn around and we find uh, people out there on, on the ground. Uh, one of our, one of the ones that we really love is called native hope. Um, uh, there's a guy, Dosh Collins, who's just, incredible guy that's that's you know we we try to support him we try to support native hope then those guys do the real work of like native hopes building a baseball field which has been a dream of ours um in south dakota on the um on actually the same reservation that i experienced 25 years ago so we just try to bring in the money and the extra funds and find the connections of the people that we can try you know we did a stickball bat uh auction with jack uh I don't know, four or five weeks ago. And all the proceeds from that went to uh, support uh, the Navajo reservation and the efforts towards um, uh, recovering from the COVID crisis. We supported Noda Begay, who's an ex-professional PGA golfer, has a foundation called MB3. Part of the funds went to him. And then part of the funds, Detroit was really struggling with COVID. So we sent a portion of the money to help uh, that, you know, which was a special case. But, you know, it's just, we're trying to 
we're not the organization. We're not the, the uh, how do you say, uh, the nonprofit. We're not the people doing that work. We're trying to bring in funds to support those people who are out there doing that every day. And that's kind of how we do it. And that works really well. Kind of spread things around a little bit. And then, you know, might sponsor a native kid here and try to just help with his equipment, just little things that we can do and stuff like that. I mean, we're someday, I mean, hopefully we'll be big enough that we can just keep getting bigger and bigger with that kind of thing. But, you know, like Jeff Amint, talk about Pearl Jam, the bass player Jeff Amint, and I got to meet him uh, one time at Jack's house. And I'd kind of seen a glimpse of this, but that guy's built something like 54 skate parks on native reservations. And he doesn't go around and tell anybody about it. But people, of course, that are receiving it are talking about him. So I kind of known about it. I got to have a conversation with him about it. And it's just like, what that guy's doing with his money is what you should do with it. You know, it's like, wow. So all those guys, man, are super inspiring to me. Yeah. I mean, and Jeff's obviously a pretty private guy from, you know, oh, yeah. re reading online and, and uh, it's, it's good to hear that he's doing that type of stuff. So your charity stuff, is there any way that anybody globally, whether it's Europe or, or Canada can get in on that action to be able to get, any of those uh, bats or stuff, or is this only in the States right now? Um, it's, it's online. Um, so I would say, I mean, we'd be willing to help people out internationally on the shipping on when it comes to those kind of things. So it's really just a matter of making sure you're following us on the socials and staying in touch because we're going to give pretty good advance notice about when we're about to do the next thing. It's kind of event driven. Um, and just buying our products though, because I mean, part of it is just, you know, as we become more and more profitable, I just, it's like a tithe, man. Like it's it's going to get sent out on a regular basis. And then the fun fundraisers are really, uh, they're just, we really like the, the fundraisers are as, as much about not just raising money, but that's a chance for us to raise awareness about things that are happening out there. Like, like what's going on in the Amaho Nation. So, um, and then hopefully there's a residual effect of people just donating on their own and things like that, which we encourage them to do. Okay. Perfect. All right. So, yeah. Well, well, I won't take up any more of your time, Ben. What uh, what no I'll worries. do though, what I'll do though is I'll encourage uh, people to go to uh, warstick.com and I'll post a uh, link to that in the uh, okay. podcast description as well as on Facebook and social media. Uh, is there any other last thing that uh, you need to say on your behalf? I know. Uh, like I said, I thank yeah. you again for doing this, and uh, it's an yeah, amazing, no amazing product. I'm gonna have to figure out how to be able to purchase some of that stuff and arrange for some shipment up to Canada because, like I said, it's pretty sick looking, and I want to get thank some you. gear to uh, to promote what a company I believe in that they're doing good things yeah. and they're bringing things to the forefront that need to be brought to the forefront. Yeah. So, Ben, um, best no luck, best luck in the future. I appreciate yeah. it. Let's stay in touch, man. Okay, thanks, man. Awesome. Talk to Peace. you soon. Yep. All right, bye-bye.